Hey, this is Ken Finnan at Capital Advantage Tutoring, and it's time for our next chapter of the SIE book. So today we're talking about chapter 18, which is employee conduct and reportable events. The U4, the U5, the U6, FINRA education, complaints, reporting requirements, and some disclosures. If you like what I'm doing, please hit like and subscribe. Okay, with chapter 18, guys, this is going to be all the employee conduct and reportable events. So let's start with the thing that starts you off. Okay, so when you register, you fill out a form U4. What's on the U4? That the U4 is how you start working. That's how you register. That's how you open. That's how you open your window. What are you gonna have to do? You're gonna have to disclose half your goddamn life. You're gonna have to put your last five years res residency. You're gonna have to put where you've been working or what you've been doing for the last ten years. You also have to put in like any kind of felonies or securities related misdemeanors, any kind of judicial actions, customer complaints, where you've been terminated, any bankruptcies, liens, bonding, all that crap. Okay, any all the disclosures you have to do. And you have to fill them out honestly, because bottom line, if you lie on this shit or it's incomplete or misleading, you can be suspended. And then that becomes reportable and it's for the rest of your life. So let's get started. OK, so now if um, if you have a uh, some sort of disclosure, whether you have a felony conviction, don't care about the charges so much, a felony conviction, a misdemeanor conviction of a, um, securities or a financial ethical manner bankruptcies, liens, like big tax liens on your stuff within the last, those are within the last 10 years, you have to disclose that. And then it's going to show up on your broker check. So understand that there's a lot out there. Don't sweat it too much. Just understand a clean U4 is one without any yes answers. Everything's clean. Not everyone has it. A lot of people do, but there's enough people that don't and they still have jobs. So don't worry about that. So now the other part is you have to file in the U4 a pre-dispute arbitration clause, which means you're not going to court. Okay, so if we have a problem with your boss or another customer or another rep, you're going to go through arbitration. Yes, they try to send you to what they call mediation first, where we kind of sit in a room together with a mediator and they go, listen, fight it out and try to figure it out and come up with a deal. That's the goal to get through it that way. If it doesn't work, then you go to arbitration. So now, um, I don't know if we talk about arbitration later, but a lot of arbitration is supposed to streamline, streamline the court process. So this way you're not going through the court for years and years and years. It's done. But the thing about arbitration, which is good and bad, is that it's not appealable. Once the arbitrator makes a decision, we're done. It's over. It's binding. You have to clear up within 30 days. Um, so what happens is if your claim, say it's a money claim. Remember, this is not for violations. This is mostly for a dispute about money or something like that. Okay. So what happens is if it's under 100 grand, it's one arbitrator. If it's over 100 grand, it's going to be three arbitrators at a panel. If it's under 50, they let you do what they call simplified, where you just mail in your stuff, and then the arbitrator makes a binding decision, not appealable. Remember that. If they throw a joke at you and they say, oh, when can you appeal it? And they give you dates. One of them is going to be can't be. That's the answer. Cannot be. The only thing really except that outside the arbitration rule is like sexual harassment or civil rights violations. Those would go – you could probably go to court on that, okay? You don't have to. You can always choose arbitration. Why would you? I'd rather go to a court if something like that happened, but so we'll go from there. Okay. Um, if I get disqualified, okay, so let's say I am, I disclose on my U4, whatever it is that I, and I have a felony or a securities related misdemeanor within the last 10 years, I can ask what they call an eligibility proceeding where they waive that tenure. They can do it. It's not going to be free. You have to have site and supervision, but you can do it. Okay. Now, every time you bring in a new hire, we have to review them. We have to go through the U5. We have to kind of do a credit check. We have to verify the accuracy of what they reported, okay? And you have to report everything that's on there. Um, I know that sounds circular, but you have to do that, and you have to do it within 30 days of filing the U4. You have to do it. Most of the time, we have to do background checks at the firm, but FINRA does a deeper background check now. They decided they were going to do it. They use the FBI or whatever it is to find it, okay? Now, if a person starts with me, they uh, and they've already worked somewhere, they're, they're going to have when they left the other firm, whether voluntary or not, you're going to have a U5, a termination. U5 is when you leave. I'm going to have to review that to see if there's any disclosures, like why they left. If it's anything other than voluntary, I may want to ask. So when you do the U5, which we'll get to at some point, um, the U5 is when you leave. If you leave and you resign, you get voluntary. If it's anything else, like 
permitted to resign or fired for cause or under, under investigation or other, which is like being laid off. When you click that button, it will also go ask, also ask for an explanation. Okay. If you hear any growling in the background, that's my eight pound dog being a jerk. Okay. The CRD is a central database where all the information is. Prior to them setting this up, whenever you came to a new firm, you had to print out your U5 and bring it and hand it to them. Now you just, basically you're just gonna give, God, I keep saying basically, right? Now really what you're gonna have to do is just fill out a form, giving them permission to check your records and then they do a search and they get all your information. So the first time you do a U4 is a real pain in the ass, filling out all this stuff. Anytime after that, you're kind of just tweaking it, updating it. Now on a, on a note, if you are, if something changes, your address changes, you get married, unmarried, whatever it is, unmarried is a nice way of saying divorced, right? Um, if any of that happens, you just have to update within 30 days. Any kind of material change where it's going to change something on you for, like a conviction, or you've been charged with a felony, you have to let us know right away. That doesn't mean you'll be disqualified. You just have to let us know you've been charged. And if they throw it away, they throw it out, they throw it out. Okay. That's the U4. Now, the U5 is when you leave, it's termination. That's all it is. They have to file the U5 within 30 days of being terminated. So if you leave, if you resign on the 1st of uh, March, they have to do it by March 30th. Or if you're fired, they have to do it by March 30th. So sometimes it sits there. Now, the other thing is, remember something. If you ever go from one firm to another, I'm just giving you a little hint. If you go from like JP Morgan to Schwab, if you go there and they make you an offer and you want to start, be careful that they don't file the U4 before you get fired from the other one or leave the other one. Because once they file the U4, it will send a notification to the other firm and say, hey, by the way, another U4 has been filed for this person. So then they know, and it's kind of like you're going to get a phone call in the morning. Okay. So again, the U5 is basically when you leave, it's termination. The U6, if you have a disciplinary action, basically the U6 is a disciplinary action or a final arbitration, which is pretty hilarious that what happens is FINRA finds you or FINRA finds something with arbitration and decides something. They know it, but then you have to fill out the U6. And if you're wrong, then they come back and they say it's delinquent or something deficient, and then you got to fill it out again. So the Form U6 is for disciplinary actions and arbitration awards and stuff like that against your RRs and the, and the firms. Okay. Okay, the wonderful thing called broker check. Broker check is where you can find out information about all the registered reps. You type their name in, you hit enter, and you see the information. All the disciplinary action where they've worked, all their registration history, all be on there. Any kind of disclosure, stuff like that. What states are registered in and kind of, I don't know if they list what licenses you've taken, but they list that you've taken certain licenses, okay? And that's free into the public, okay? So the broker check, you can and you can check on anyone. As a, as a compliance officer, I can go into the CRD and check out people I have permission and much deeper dive. But the broker check, it, broker check is really so that public can really take a look at um, who they're dealing with. Okay, so investor education. FINRA requires that member firms at least once a calendar year send out, it provide to each customer in writing, which could be email or whatever it is, or on their website, I guess, the FINRA's broker check hotline number and, and FINRA's website address. And basically saying the investor brochure, which helps you um, figure out how to handle a complaint, is available. And it's describing broker check. Okay, so you're kind of, you're not just saying, hey, broker check's out there, nobody knows about it. Once a year, but usually just putting on your website is good enough. Um, you have to tell them about broker check. You have to tell them about the Fender website, and then you have to tell them a little bit about broker check. Okay. MSRB rules also contain an investor education rule, which says these things have to be sent every year that you're registered with the MSRB and SEC, that here's the MSRB website and that there's an investor brochure for people who complain. So if someone complains to an MSRB firm, they have to get the investors of Assure right away. Now, if you screw up and you have something on there, say there's a mark on your U4 or something like that, so maybe you talk to a client wrong or something like that, you can, or you think it's wrong, you can actually sue to get it expunged. It's not an easy process. It takes a while. But if they expunge it, it's gone. So expungement is when there's something's in, it's either factually impossible or erroneous or information is false. There's other ways to get rid of it. If you have a good lawyer, they can always find a way sometimes. That's funny. I say they can always find a way sometimes. It doesn't really work. But they can usually find some way to get it off, okay? Um, and once it's off, it's off. It's gone. Okay, what the hell is a complaint? Okay, a complaint 
is a written form. It could be text message, email. Hell, I think it can't be skywriting, but text message, email, Twitter post. That's not really a good one, but it's still written. Email, writing it down, whatever. A, a written complaint. If they call you, it's not a complaint. But if they email it to you or put it in writing, then you, the member firm has to keep a record of it, keep a record of all complaints in a separate file. They have to keep it for four years. Remember, complaints are held for four years, okay? So there you go. So you have to. You also have to keep on record a description of the action you took. You don't actually have to respond to the client right away, okay? But you have to set. You have to basically explain what you did and keep a record of that. What's weird is that even if you don't have complaints, when you get audited, you still have to show the empty folder. So every year there is a complaint folder, and even if you just deal with institutions and there's no complaints or anything. You still have to have a folder and say, look, here's my folder for 2021. There's nothing in it. Okay. I think I went over this already that basically any come there's a, oh my I think I sort of touched this already. Updates to the CRD, which will update your U4. If basically, if anything happens, if there's subject of a written complaint, if you've been violated any securities law, if you've been denied registration or expelled by anyone, if you've been named as a defendant in any proceeding, or a violation of securities law. If you've been indicted or convicted or pled guilty. Now remember, that's not the same as statutory disqualification. SD, which means you can't work, is if you've been convicted. But if you've been if you've been indicted, convicted, or pled guilty or no contest to any felony or securities and securities misdemeanor, then you have to disclose it. Being charged doesn't get you kicked out, but you have to disclose it. Also, if you're a director or partner officer, sole prop of a firm like investment company, rookie dealer, that's been suspended or expelled. So if say you've already gotten disclosed that you work for ABC broker dealer, but you're also work for like Dewey Cheatham and Howe investment advisor and you're a partner and they get nailed or expelled or something like that, you have to disclose to the broker dealer that that happened and that they can update your U4. Okay. If you're being sued by another member firm or something, and it's um and it's for more than twenty five hundred bucks. You have to report that within thirty days. So bottom line, if you don't remember any of the shit I just said, remember any updates to the CRD or U four have to be within thirty days. Change your address, all that stuff. Every quarter, broker dealers slash FINRA members, same thing, have to report basically and give a summary of their complaints. If you don't have one, if you don't have any complaints during that quarter, then you don't have to file a report. Red flags. Okay, so the SEC also put in this what they call a red flag program. So a red flag program is kind of like a warning system that if something's, ah, it doesn't smell right, okay? So broker dealers have to have what they call reasonable supervision. They have to follow internal company procedures and do stuff. So they have to try to be proactive and reactive. We can't catch everything, but if you, as long as you commit reasonable procedures to find stuff and have a red flag program, you should be okay. So what happens? Red flag kicks up, some sort of red flag kicks up, and maybe somebody wired a bunch of times or something, or maybe you find out that somebody's commissions are really high, or maybe you see that every, like John Jones is every one of his customers, but GameStop, who knows? These are all little red flags that could come up. So what's the first thing you do? No, you don't fire the guy. First thing you do is investigate. Then you document and then you finish it. Okay, it's that easy. If they say, what's the first thing you do? It is never just fire the guy or, or terminator, whatever it is. It is investigate, find out the information, document your shit, and then finish it up. That's what it is. That's the rules. Okay, anytime the red flag shows up, you investigate, you document, you pursue, and you go to the end. Now, remember, a red flag doesn't mean something has happened. It's just like, hey, take a look and make sure everything's kind of not smelling funny. Woo, woo, woo. Okay, so let's do this. Outside business activity. So like me, I tutor outside my broker dealer. So what did I have to do? I had to let my firm know. I have to give them prior written notice that they're doing it. I do not need permission, okay? But I do have to let them know. But here's the thing. It's weird. I don't need prior written permission, but they can say no, okay? Now, the other part is if I do, even if you do part-time, like I was refereeing lacrosse for 10 years, I had to tell Bank of America. Even, I mean, it was barely, you know, it was nine weeks a year. Made a bit of money, but nine weeks a year is all part-time. It wasn't a real full-on job. I still had to let Bank of America know. Now, if I do charity or volunteer work, I don't have to be documented. I don't have to tell them. 
Remember, the reason you're doing this is to make sure there's not a out, there's not a conflict of interest. Because God forbid, you know, you're at work, they're working a deal on someone. You take a job with a firm that has some like tangential, I don't know what's the word, tangential um effect, like impact with the firm they're underwriting that you didn't see. Maybe they see it or maybe they don't, but it's good to know. Okay, private securities transactions. This is when you do stuff outside the firm. Okay, when you do transactions outside the firm, this is like if you if your buddy opens a new golfing app and he or she needs to help you help you to help them get investors. I'm studying full today. You to help get them investors. You have to let the firm know no matter what, even if you're not getting paid. If you're getting paid, you need permission. If you're doing it as a volunteer, as a favor, you still have to notify, but you don't have to get permission. If you don't do either one of those, that's called selling away and it's a violation. So selling away is doing per private securities transactions without permission. So like I worked at two different broker dealers. I worked at, you know, one, they do cheat them now and we got some money, right? So say I worked at both of them. So DCH, I worked there and any transaction I did at DCH was a private securities transaction to we got your money. Anything I did at We Got Your Money was at um, was a private securities transaction to do we cheat them and how. I had permission to do both. If I didn't get permission, one of those would be considered selling away, which is a violation and you're in trouble. Okay, the one of the gift limit stuff. So what's the deal? So if you have a gift, so they call it influencing and rewarding the employees of others. So what happens is the maximum gift you can give to anyone is 100 bucks. It doesn't work for your firm. So you can give gifts inside your firm for more than that. But if they were, but it has to be disclosed and all that shit. But any kind of gift that you give to someone who's not at your firm, there's a max of $100. Okay. And this based on the on the market value, the greater the market value or what you paid for it. So if you give, now there's exceptions to this. So basically if it's personal, like say somebody gets married, has a funeral, not that I give gifts at funerals, but buying flowers and stuff like that, a birth or something like that, any of those things. You can go outside the hundred dollars, but it can't be excessive. Like you can't get the person a Bentley for getting married. Okay. You can get him a gift, you can get him a bassinet or something like that, but it can't be excessive. Like, you know, again, you can't get him a Bentley. But these things, those things don't count toward your hundred dollar limit. So if the person gets married in January and has a kid in September and you give him two hundred dollar gifts full time, you still have a hundred dollar gift you can give for business. Also, you can do stuff like um Basically, de minimis, what they call it, it, means it's too small to care. Like if you give an umbrella or a tote bag or like T-shirts or something like that, they can't be they're not, they can't be like diamond bracelets with their logo on it. But they got to be basically commemorative gifts that are small and they're just little tiny things. They don't count toward your limit. Entertainment, the manna of heaven, right? Okay, so entertainment. There's no limit on the entertainment limit. Again, it can't be excessive, but business entertainment is not. There's no limit on it. There's no there's no limit. That's the bottom line. But it can't be excessive. Like if you take your client out to dinner every single night, that would be excessive. On this test, they're not going to ask you what's excessive. They're going to say it's a gift. Boom, it's a $100 limit. If it's entertainment, there's no limit. So let's go through the scenario that they always ask. You give two, ticket, two $75 tickets to your client. When is this okay? Well, it's not okay, first of all, because it's more than 100 bucks. But if you go with them to the game, a ticket to a basketball game, if you go with them to the game, then it's entertainment and then there's no problem. But if you give it to them on their own and you don't go, then it's a gift and it might be a problem. So now what happens if you're about to go and you're supposed to go with your client, you have the two, two tickets that are $100 each if you want, you're going to go with the third ticket and then you get sick or your husband calls you up or your wife calls you up and says you have to come home and you can't go. Well, if, you do, if somebody from the firm doesn't go, that becomes a gift and you have a problem. So send somebody. Just send someone from the firm to go and entertain them, and then you're good to go. If you're a registered rep, you cannot accept payment directly from a mutual fund or an investment company if, if for selling their products. If you do, that's a problem. So what, what's really going to happen is you're going to sell the mutual fund. The mutual fund will pay your broker dealer, who will then pay who determine your compensation based on that. RRs cannot accept compensation directly from people who want to sell their shit. So there's a thing called sales contests. So here's the problem with this. So sales contests are okay. They're actually, so you can have a thing. You say everyone in the office, hey, everyone, the one who sells the most commission-based stuff gets a trip to the Bahamas or something like that. The reason I stopped in the middle of that is because what happens is it used to be that we'd say, listen, whoever sells the most variable annuities or the most this or most that, 
That's not okay. It can't be based on a product. It can be based on total commissions or sales, but not for products. Because you can't say, listen, whoever sells the most variable annuities gets a reward. You can't do that because then you're telling people to push variable annuities, even if they're not suitable. So political contributions are limited. MSRB rules limit your political contributions to $250 per election for someone they can vote for. So if you live in Chatham, you can give it to a Chatham, a state senator, and a congressperson, but you can't give to the mayor of another town or of de Blasio or of New York or something like that. Why you would, I don't know, but whatever. So you can only, as an MFP, which we'll get to the description in a second, could contribute up to $250 per election. Now, per election means primary and general. So really, they do the primary, then they do the general in November. That's two elections. That's 500 bucks, 250 per. Who this applies to are MFPs, municipal finance professionals. These are associated persons of broker dealers who primarily engage in underwriting, trading, sales, financial advisory, or consulting. If all you do is give ideas or solicit people to buy retail clients to buy mini securities, you're not considered an MFP. So that's why sometimes they say MFPs are associated persons in the dealing of with munis other than retail. So if you're dealing with just retail clients and recommending them to buy a muni here or there, this mm-hmm. doesn't apply. So MFPs are prohibited from giving more than $250 per election for a candidate that they can vote for. So if they give even a penny to a person they can't vote for, then they're blocked out. And what's the punishment? The punishment is two-year ban. So that means if you give $300 to a campaign in one election, too much, you and you are banned from doing business for two years, underwriting business for two years with that firm, and so is your firm. So if you break the rule and give and you violate this rule of giving more than 250, then you, the MFP, plus your firm are banned from doing negotiated deals for that issuer for two years. And, and if you leave and go to a new firm, that firm has to finish out the ban also. Now, if you have a joint account, say you're married, you and your husband are married and you have a joint account and you decide to give $500 to a campaign, as long as both of you sign it, that's okay because then it's $250 each. But if you have a joint account and your husband's on it and you forget to have him sign it too, then the entire amount goes towards you. And if it was a $500 check, you'd have a violation. And then what would happen? Your firm and you would be banned from doing negotiated offerings for the next two years for that issuer. And that is all she wrote. That was a quick one. Not so long. Shouldn't be that long. You should be able to make through it. Guys, thank you for sticking through. 18, we got two more chapters to go. 20 is going to be a a kicker. It's all risks and shit like that. Please stay tuned. If you like what I'm doing, join my lives on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, and wash your hands. And please like, subscribe, and share.